Greetings comrades, I am Ben Irvin and I am the voice of Scottish Socialism in Inverclyde. On Friday the 30th of November 1923, a stunned working class population of Scotland read in their newspapers that their great leader, John McLean, was dead. He was only 44, but years of selfless toil in the service of the people, coupled with the hardships he had suffered during successive terms of imprisonment, had seriously undermined McLean's health. McLean's death was a blow to the working class movement, not only in Scotland, but throughout the world. The acclaimed Scottish poet, Hugh McDermott, recalled McLean with the following words. Scotland has had few men whose names matter, or should matter, to intelligent people. But of these McLean, next to Burns, was the greatest, and it should be of him with every Scotsman and Scotswoman to the end of time, as it was of Lenin in Russia. When you might talk to a woman who had been a young girl in 1917, and find that the name of Stalin lit no fires, but when you asked her if she had ever seen Lenin, her eyes would light up, and her reply was the Russian word which means both beautiful and red. Lenin, she said, was Krasvi, Krasvi. John McLean, too, was Krasvi, Krasvi. A description no other Scot has ever deserved. The esteem in which he was held was reflected at his funeral, which was attended by over 10,000 people. Capturing the man's life and song, the ballad of John McLean, here is Mark McGinn. It's a song about a First World War hero who was not decorated for the simple reason, or for one very good reason, that his heroism, and it was real heroism in my opinion, was displayed in his fight against the First World War. His name was John McLean. He was a Glasgow school teacher. Tell me where you're gone, mad, and who you're gone to meet. I'm headed for the station that's in Buchanan Street. I'll join 200,000 that's there to meet the train that's bringing back to Glasgow our own dear John McLean. Down in May, down in May. There was none like John McLean, the fighting down in May. Tell me where he's been, lad, why has he been there? They've had him in the prison for preaching in the square. For Johnny held a finger at all the hills he saw. He was right side all the people, he was right side all the law. Dominate, dominate. There was none like John McLean, the fighting dominate. Johnny was a teacher in one of Glasgow schools. The golden law was silence, but Johnny broke the rules. For a world of social justice, young Johnny couldn't wait. He took his chalk and easel to the men at the shipyard gate. Dominate, dominate. There was name like John McLean, the fighting dominate. The leaders of the nation made money hand or fist Be grinding down the people with a fiddle and the twist Aided and the pitted with a preacher and the press John called for revolution and he called for nothing less Dominate, dominate There was name like John McLean, the fighting dominate the bosses and the judges united as one man For Johnny was a menace to the 1418 plan They wanted men for slaughter and the fields of armateurs John called upon the people to smash the profiteers Dominate, dominate There was name like John McLean, the fighting dominate They brought him to the court in Edinburgh town But still he didn't cower He firmly held his ground And stoutly he defended His every word and deed Five years it was his sentence In the jail and Peter Heed Dominate, Dominate There 
was named like John McLean, the fighting down in May. Seven months he lingered in prison misery, till the people rose in fury in Glasgow and Dundee. Lloyd George and all his cronies were shaken to the core. The prison gates were opened and Johnny's freedom swore. Come and lay, come and lay. There was name like John McLean, the fighting dominate. At times it seems like everyone in Scotland claims to be following in the footsteps of Maclean, from the Communist Party on the left to the SNP on the right. This has led many to ask a question, was Maclean a socialist or a nationalist? To those who have studied the man, it is obvious he wasn't a nationalist. His desire to see Scotland independent was not based on a narrow parochialism, but on a much broader understanding of the necessary eventual failure of the British capitalist class and on a belief in internationalism. In fact, the stand that Maclean took on the topic of Scottish independence in the first few decades of the 20th century are remarkably similar to the stance that the Scottish Socialist Party takes now in the first few decades of the 21st century. While this is now regarded as the obvious moral position of any true socialist, in Maclean's day it was the opposite and led to many criticisms of the man from people who should really have stood by him. As the referendum has shown, History has proven Maclean to be correct, and so we see many people who were always dismissive of Maclean's politics on independence, such as the ultra-London-centric Socialist Workers' Party, now try to claim Maclean's name. While John Maclean's legacy belongs to the whole of Scotland, he does of course have a special relationship with Inverclyde, and Greenock in particular. Early in 1908, Maclean issued his first pamphlet, The Greenock Jungle. In this early piece of writing, Maclean displayed his characteristic concern for the plight of the working classes and anger at the selfishness and insidiousness of the profit-chasing classes. The pamphlet itself was a strong indictment of the slaughterhouse methods and trade in diseased meats that was being carried out in Greenock at the time. This pamphlet was a result of the tireless campaigning Maclean did in Greenock. He could often be found at the gates of the slaughterhouse in what used to be Crown Street addressing the workers as they arrived for or left work. One such worker is prominent in Maclean's pamphlet, and I'm certainly interested in finding out more about the person. The Greenock worker who featured so heavily in Maclean's pamphlet was a Mr Houston. He plays a central role due to the fact that he was the one who exposed many of the practices being carried out by the owners of the slaughterhouses, which included selling diseased meat for human food. It was a practice that targeted poor people, as any diseased meat would be made into cheap sausages for being sold to the working classes. Maclean argued that this was a direct cause of the tuberculosis amongst the working class, and as a result of his campaigning, a government inspector was appointed to investigate the slaughterhouse conditions. Mr Houston deserves further mention for his role in these events. As a socialist, he was fully aware that he was risking his own job by exposing the practices of the slaughterhouse owners, but he did so anyway as he was driven on by a desire to protect his own class from disease and death. Mr Houston, after 31 years of service, was forced out of work as a result of his whistleblowing. His employer was a broker who the owners of the slaughterhouses boycotted until they got rid of Mr Houston. When the pamphlet was published, Mr Houston had already been unemployed for eight months, and Maclean makes an appeal in it to the good people of Greenock to assist in finding Mr Houston new employment. They certainly owed much to him, given his selfless defence of their health to his own detriment. So while the guilty owners continued to enjoy the profits of their enterprises, for only protecting others, Mr Houston ended up in poverty. Maclean commented, Why should the guilty one enjoy such a great privilege, while the innocent one must suffer the worries of unemployment and the fears and forebodings accompanying the prospect of immediate financial ruin. Maclean is commenting here on a theme that continues to this day, when we think about the persecution of the likes of Snowden and Manning. I don't know what eventually became of Mr Houston. If anyone does know, I would be delighted to hear from you. Of course, this affair was not the only time Maclean would visit these parts. We find many references in the history books to Maclean coming here to address the workers. One such reference captures perfectly Maclean's attitude and enthusiasm for politics. A member of the Scottish District Council recorded, 
I stayed with John McLean, and I must say, he is the most earnest worker for socialism I have ever met. He has just spent his seven weeks holiday preaching socialism in the north of England and Scotland. On my last day he arranged a sail down the Clyde, getting back to Greenock in time to give my last address. After I had left to catch my train to London, McLean stepped onto the platform and went on with the meeting. McLean also gave up much of his free time to give education to working men and women and was often giving evening classes in Greenock on the topic of Marxist economics. In fact, McLean's activities were such that he earned himself an enemy in the British state, who on more than one occasion had him imprisoned. As a result, there were many demonstrations up and down the country in defence of McLean, a sentiment that is captured here in a song titled simply John McLean, recorded by Alistair MacDonald. When you've passed your resolutions and you feel you've done your bit And you think there's nothing more that you can do Why not act and in your actions emulate the grit Of the man in Peterhead who acts for you Of the man in Peterhead who acts for you he is grateful for your money, he appreciates your cheers Your sympathy is ample for his needs But there are more important things than resolutions, cash or tears Why not give him just a sample, say, of deeds? Why not give him just a sample, say, of deeds? T'was for you he garnered knowledge, sacrificed his very youth He worked for you until his head was grey they are killing him by inches just because he thought the truth And having thought it had the guts to say And having thought it had the guts to say For the truth's a kind of virtue that the ruling classes fear By the foulest means to crush it they have tried For truth the stones of hate were hurled at prophet and at seer For truth the gentle Christ was crucified for truth the gentle Christ was crucified He will pay you back in plenty It's you who stand to gain His lion heart is yours if he is spared So workers for your own sakes Liberate McLean You could do it I tomorrow if you dare You could do it I tomorrow if you dare Will you suffer his destruction on the tyrant's battleground? Will you let the cursed wrong defeat the right? He is one against an army, are you going to see him downed? Are you going to let him die without a fight? Are you going to let him die without a fight? He will pay you back in plenty, it's you who stand to gain. For his lion heart is yours if he is spared. Then workers for your own sakes, liberate McLean. You could do it, I tomorrow if you dare. You could do it, I tomorrow if you dare. For many, McLean will always be remembered as a great anti war hero, and it's probably for this reason more than any that his memory is so dangerous to the British ruling class to the extent that his name doesn't even appear in the approved school textbooks from which our children learn about the First World War. There is much a need today for Maclean's message as there was during that terrible war. As we see our country drift closer and closer to militarism, we need those voices who speak out, those who see the working class as more than mere cannon fodder to be used by our imperialist masters in their illegal wars. The poppy, once a symbol of remembrance of all those wasted lives, is now being used by right-wing politicians as a symbol of British exceptionalism. We have TV adverts from companies such as Sainsbury's portraying the First World War as a rather pleasant experience. And now we even have the Royal British Legion attempting to sanitise the war by releasing a heavily edited version of the famous anti-war song, The Greenfields of France, which omits any criticism of the war. What McLean knew was that, despite the jingoism and propaganda from the British state, the First World War was not fought to keep us safe. It was a war for colonies, for spheres of influence, for markets, 
In other words, it was a war for profits. A great Scot and contemporary of Maclean said, If these men must die, would it not be better to die in their own country fighting for freedom, for their class, and for the abolition of war, than to go forth to strange countries and die slaughtering and slaughtered by their brothers, that tyrants and profiteers might live? These sentiments by James Connolly were shared by Maclean and were also captured in the previously mentioned song, The Greenfields of France. Well, how to do, Private William McBride? Do you mind if I sit here down by your grey side? And I'll rest for a while in the warm summer sun. I've been walking all day, Lord, and I'm nearly done. I see by your gravestone we were only nineteen when you joined the glorious fallen in 1916. Well, I hope you died quick and I hope you died clean. Our Willie. But I was it slow and the sea Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they sound the fight lowly? Did the rifles fire o'er ye as they lowered you down? Did the bugles sing the last post in chorus? Did the pipes play the flute? The and did you leave a wife for a sweetheart behind? In some faithful heart is your memory and shine. And though you died back in nineteen. Sixteen to that loyal heart, are you always nineteen? Or are you a stranger without even a name, forever enshrined behind some glass pane in the known photograph, torn and tattered and stained? And fading to yellow in a brown leather frame. Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they sound the five lonely? Did the rifles fire on ye as they lowered you down? Did the bugles sing the last post in chorus? Did the pipes play? Well, the sun's shining now on these green fields of France. The warm wind blows gently and the red poppies dance. The trenches have vanished long under. Gas and no barbed wire, no guns fighting now. But here in this graveyard, it's still no man's land. The countless white crosses in mute witness stand. To man's blind indifference to his fellow man. And a whole generation who were butchered and down. Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they sound the five lonely? Did the rifles fire o'er ye as they lower you down? Did the bugles sing the last post in chorus? Did the pipes play the flute to the forest? And 
and I can't help but wonder now, Willie McBride, do all those who lie here know why they died? Did you really believe them when they told you the cause? You really believe that in this war would end war? Suffering, the sorrow, the glory, the shame, the killing, the dying, it was all done in vain. For Willie McBride it all happened again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Did they beat the drum slowly? They sound the five lonely Did the rifles fire or ye As they lower you down Did the bugles sing the last post in chorus Did the pipes play the flutes of the fall In the years leading up to the outbreak of war, Britain had seen a great deal of left-wing activity, and Maclean was certainly recognised as one of the leaders of the left. Between 1911 and 1914, trade union membership had doubled, and Brits were increasingly active in internationalist socialist circles. At the International Socialist Congress in Copenhagen, British socialists were amongst those who agreed that Should war break out, it is their duty to intervene to promptly bring it to an end and with all their energies to use the political and economic crisis created by the war to rouse the populace from its slumbers and to hasten the fall of capitalist domination. Instead, and much to Maclean's dismay, when war did indeed break out, many of these same socialists entered their national governments to help the war effort. Leading British socialists such as Hindman actively and enthusiastically supported the war, including speaking on recruitment platforms. While a majority of socialists in the country didn't sink this low, Many did argue that the war could be supported on grounds of defence to keep us safe from supposed German aggression. Maclean had no time for either position. He argued right from the start that the war couldn't be defended on any terms. Plunderers versus plunderers with the workers as pawns. It is our business as socialists to develop class patriotism, refusing refusing to murder one another for a sordid world capitalism. Maclean was clear that only socialists could bring about an acceptable end to the war. He insisted that a capitalist settlement of the war could only lead to further wars between the capitalist powers. His position stood out like a sore thumb at the time, but has proven to be correct, as the settlement reached at the end of that war led directly to that other great war of the 20th century, the Second World War. When we look back at the First World War through the eyes of the British state and its propaganda machine, the mainstream media, we would be forgiven for believing that there was universal and enthusiastic support for the war in the country. We are told that conscientious objectors were widely hated and considered to be cowards. This of course is a complete misrepresentation of history. The war was in fact deeply unpopular with the population and there were massive anti-war demonstrations all over the country. In fact, the anti-war movement during the First World War was even larger than what greeted New Labour when they made the despicable and illegal decision to take us to war in Iraq. The greatest threat to Lloyd George's terrorist regime in London was not the German troops, but the anger of the British working class, which in Scotland was led by Maclean. In order to impose their will and ensure that their monarch got his war with his German cousin, the London government had to enact a series of emergency draconian laws to control the workers which included suspending many civil liberties and making it illegal to strike. 
To Maclean, they were even more severe. For speaking out against the war, the British ruling class twice had Maclean jailed in Peterhead. The treatment he received while he was locked up was horrendous. He was drugged and force-fed, and this time inside had such an adverse effect on his health that it contributed to his early death in 1923. That the ruling class would turn on Maclean is no surprise. He was, after all, according to their own head of military intelligence, Basil Thompson, the most dangerous man in Britain. Basil Thompson, we now know from declassified documents, was involved in a deliberate campaign to smear Maclean by spreading rumours about his sanity. The British state knew fine well that Maclean was sane, but the British left were only too keen to jump on this particular bandwagon. Maclean stood for an independent Scotland, which has earned him an everlasting vilification by the British left. All the British writing about Maclean declare him to be insane. Even today, the Socialist Workers' Party continues to vilify Maclean due to his stance on independence. Their reasoning is easy to understand, as due to their own political bigotry, they are unable to view any Scot who does not want to be ruled by London as anything other than insane or fascist or racist. Any slander will do. But while the British left vilified Maclean, to the Scottish left he was a hero. Beyond this island, he was held in the highest regard by international socialists. In recognition of his principled stand against the mass slaughter of ordinary people in the First World War, the Bolsheviks elected Maclean an honorary president of the first All-Russian Congress of Soviets, along with Lenin, Trotsky, Leibniz, Adler and Spiridonova, which was ecstatically received on his beloved Clyde, an area which had become known as Red Clyde Side due to the likes of Maclean and many others. He became Lenin's man in Scotland when the Soviet leader ordered that the Russian consul be handed over to him. He was refused a visa to visit Russia. He could have travelled illegally but decided not to. It was a tactical error on Maclean's part and one which only increased his isolation in British politics. As it transpired, a certain Willie Gallagher took the opportunity to meet Lenin which Maclean had passed up. Like other revolutionaries of the period, Maclean hadn't fully grasped the significance of the Bolshevik party even after the October Revolution. With the encouragement of Lenin, Gallagher became instrumental in setting up the Communist Party of Great Britain, largely funded by wealth from Moscow. The Bolsheviks regarded Maclean as the authentic voice of the revolution in Britain, but he never joined the new party, although he remained a convinced revolutionary and a supporter of Lenin. His own party would never enjoy the success that Maclean's popularity seemed to indicate it should. Party membership never amounted to more than a few hundred, and votes never more than a few thousand. His tactical errors in failing to meet with Lenin or secure funding from the Soviets were fatal to his political career. He continued to campaign for the Scottish working class right up to his death, but sadly left nothing behind in way of a bold political organisation. Other than fade into political obscurity, however, Maclean remains every bit as relevant today as he was to those countless working class men who were sent to their unnecessary deaths during the Great War, or to Mr Houston, whom he personally campaigned for when the bosses turned on him. Today, Maclean's message about the necessity of revolution appeals to a new generation who are clamouring for real political change. In May 1918, when facing jail for inciting the workers to transform war into revolution, he made his famous speech from the dock. I am not here as the accused. I am here as the accuser of capitalism dripping with blood from head to foot. In the next five years there is going to be a great world trade depression and the respective governments must turn more and more to the markets of the world to get rid of their produce. And in 15 years time from the close of this war we are into the next war if capitalism lasts we cannot escape it. My appeal is to the working class. I appeal exclusively to them because they and they alone can bring about the time when the whole world can be in one brotherhood on a sound economic foundation. That and that alone can be the means of bringing about a reorganization of society. 
that can only be obtained when the people of the world get the world and retain the world. McLean stood for internationalism, socialism and independence. That message is relevant now more than ever. We must keep the memory of McLean alive to ensure that the message does not die with the man. To end with, here is a song that McLean would have known and would have sang many times. The Red Flag, here recorded by Jim Connell. People's flag is deepest red it shrouded oft our martyr dead And ere their limbs grew stiff and cold Their hearts' blood died It's a fold So raise the scarlet standard high Within its shade we live and die Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer We keep the red flag flying And the Frenchman loves its blaze The sturdy German chants its praise In Moscow's vaults, its hymns are sung Chicago swells, its surging throng So is the scarlet standard high Within its shade we live and die Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer We'll keep the red flag flying here It's waved above our infant nights When all I had seemed dark as night And it's witnessed many years of deed and bow We mustn't change its colour now So is the scarlet Standard high Within its shade We live and die Though cowards flinch And traitors sneer We'll keep the red flag Flying Well recalls our triumphs past It gives us hope of peace at last The symbol breaks the message plain Of human rights and human gain So is the scarlet standard high Within its shade we live and die Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer We'll keep the red flag flying here With our heads uncovered Swear we are The bear at hand Till we fall Come dungeons dark Or gallows grim This song will be Our parting hymn so is the scarlet standard high Within its shade we live and die Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer We'll keep the red flag flying I've been Ben Irvin. Until next time, power and peace to the people.